Welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research and advocacy group. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. Before I introduce this week's guest, I would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present, and we are grateful for the continuing care of the lands, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. This week, I'm pleased to welcome Nicole Capano to talk about sustainable businesses, products and living sustainably. Nicole is a business transformation specialist and sustainable living advocate who uses her experience in motivating and leading teams to connect and inspire behaviour change in our community. Welcome, Nicole, and thank you for joining me. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Not too bad. As we get started, most people think of sustainable living as being fairly self-reliant, growing your own food and collecting water. Do you agree that that's the goal? That's a very hard question straight off the bat. (laughs) (laughs) Yes and no. Sustainability is a process. I stopped using the word sustainability because of those exact reasons that you've spoken about. I try and talk more about being carbon conscious, so making personal choices that consider our impact on the earth. I know that's not quite the answer to your question, but sustainability has become one of those words that people sort of cringe at. I know we're changing a lot and it's becoming more acceptable, but... Yeah, I think it's coupled as it grows. There's also an increasing backlash against it because it's okay for people who do want to live that kind of self-reliant lifestyle, but other people go, well, I don't know, I like using my computer. Yeah, look, totally agree. So I try and talk to people more about, okay, well, you don't have to be a hippie and live in Mullumbimby or wherever. You can actually make small changes in your life that are simple. They don't cost you any more money and also, but they benefit the environment as well. And I live with one, so (laughs) (laughs) it makes my life quite challenging. (laughs) You live with a hippie or somebody who doesn't? uh... Someone who doesn't want to know about climate change. Right, okay. (laughs) That must be hard. Does that create conflict or...? It does, but it's all about small steps, like anything, yep. any change, small steps, making it easy and education as to why it's important. And we've got kids, three of them, so it's important for them, obviously, for the future. Yep. So it's just trying to understand where he's coming from, but also where I'm coming from at the same time. Yeah, so try to meet in the middle and go, okay, well, we can do these small things. So with Carbon Conscious... Do you take steps to like measure the emissions that you personally, like your household produces or anything like that? Yes, in a small way, I guess. I probably do more than I realise. We work from home. We have solar on our roofs. We have water tanks. So we're self-sufficient in that way. In saying that, though, we purchased a house that was derelict um, a number of years ago and we've been making that as sustainable, like as in sustainable housing. So trying yeah. to utilise the sun and for heating rather than air conditioning we're certainly not perfect but we are trying to do the right thing there are benefits right like when you're talking about being efficient that's cutting down your costs as well everyone's aware of the cost of petrol and electricity at the moment I mean who couldn't be unless you're you know hiding in a ditch somewhere um but yeah it definitely having solar and owning your own home it's an advantage and makes life a lot easier as far as making sustainable choices because landlords aren't always willing to put solar or make these changes on behalf of their tenants because it does cost a little bit of money and it's a little bit inconvenient. I did an episode previously speaking about like sustainable housing, talking about things that like renters can do to try and make their houses, you know, not having to rely on the air conditioning and things like that. I know that you've got your own business that you're launching with Buy Sustainable. So when you're looking at adding things to that, what kind of factors do you consider when looking at sustainable products? 
Okay, so obviously it depends on what type of products because as you can imagine, looking at something like clothing versus looking at website hosting, for argument's sake, there it's a very yeah. different process. So if you're looking at clothing, I try and promote local as much as possible. It's still expensive to manufacture a lot of things in Australia, so it's not always possible to find a local solution. Website hosting... There's a number of different companies that are carbon neutral. So as a service, um, and a lot of people aren't aware of that. One of my girlfriends comes to my house not very often. We don't live very close to each other. But every time she comes in, she goes through all my drawers and all my cupboards. (laughs) She's like, I didn't know this was a thing. It's electric bamboo toothbrushes because you can have the replaceable heads that are all biodegradable. It's about making simple choices. So to start with, it'll be about trying to do the right thing, whether it's about recycling or as simple as buying a compostable dishcloth, little things that make a world of difference. I feel like there is definitely a movement towards the zero waste products and things like that, which is great to see. The thing that my girlfriends often say to me, and let's face it, the girls in the family generally do the shopping. That's a sweeping (laughs) generalisation, I know, and I apologise to any of the guys out there that do it. Um, (laughs) But they're often looking after the children and they don't have time to go and find these things. So it's just sort of having a, a place where you can go as a resource to find these things. And Buy Sustainable is not going to sell anything. It's a reference guide, for want of a better word. Right, so it's a list of going, hey, these are things that you can get or use to... Yeah, whether it's stainless steel pegs or reusable coffee cups or even the bakery that I go to because I go to the bakery with my bread bag and for the first few times I was there, I would teach the staff how you fold it up and all that sort of stuff and now they sell them. Yeah, I have found that having those conversations could really open up things like that. Setting those trends, essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And look, I won't mention the big supermarket that I was at the other day, but I noticed that they had the produce bags that you, you know, put your tomatoes or, or yeah, whatever yeah. In, instead of, but they're selling them now. So I was like, oh, wow. But I was um, quite surprised that they hit the mainstream. <laughs> right, yeah, instead of the little plastic bags. I think in New South Wales they recently banned single-use plastic bags. I see them occasionally in some of the supermarkets. Right, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so when you're looking at a sustainable business, can you tell me like how would you approach helping a business become sustainable? It's not a one-stop solution. I wish it was, Rebecca, a simple (laughs) answer to give you. (laughs) But obviously every business is different. Some have systems in place um, when it comes to sustainability. Others have not even contemplated the word, (laughs) (laughs) let alone the process. It depends on what they do. So if they manufacture products, it's looking at their whole business and looking at opportunities in the three different pillars that they can improve. What are those pillars? I knew you were going to ask me that. um, (laughs) The first two pillars are internal parts of your business, so they drill down to the internals. The third pillar is all about your suppliers and supply chain. The specifics of that, I cannot... Yeah, no, that's fine. That's more for your information than (laughs) including this little uh, conversation that we're having. (laughs) So you're looking at, like, internal practices and then looking externally at supply chains, there's been a big push at the moment towards it zero and trying to like reduce carbon. Look, a company that I admire is carbon neutral and all of their deliveries are carbon neutral. So they've really done a lot of work on their supply chain, the product, and also how they deliver the product. And they've started to expand their product range and I don't work for them. (laughs) They have the compostable cloths and things like that. So it's just looking at the company and seeing the lowest hanging fruit to make change and then making a plan. It's not all going to happen on day one. It's a process. Right, yeah. So it's not, you know, like click your fingers and all of a sudden you're magically sustainable. It's No, but again, there's things that you can change really quickly. Like if you're a business owner, you can change your website hosting to a company that's carbon neutral and there's a couple of them out there you can go paperless so you remove a fair bit of waste and there are little things processes but depending on the size of your company and how many people and what you actually do you can't 
just go take away people's notepads <laughs> and go, oh, there you go, here's a tablet to use. You know, like taking notes here, but I'm actually using recycled paper as well. So I think that's something that like that circular economy of reusing things. From a business perspective, that's going to be good kind of yeah. cost as well. Absolutely. When you want to add businesses that have sustainable business practices and products, how do you make sure that they're honest about their sustainability? That's a difficult one. The idea about buy sustainable, though, is not necessarily about the business. There will be businesses will be highlighted to a degree, but it's more about the product. Right. So let's say McDonald's bought out a um, bamboo toothbrush, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> unlikely, I know, but hey, <laughs> you hope that that bamboo toothbrush is going to be sustainable and biodegradable and all that sort of thing. But the rest of McDonald's may not be. So I don't want to penalise companies that are trying to transition. They're trying to do the right thing around certain product lines. Businesses that will bring that out because it is the new black or whatever the case may be. But the whole idea is more around the product than around the business. Your focus is on the end product specifically. Look, in saying that there are amazing businesses out there, but I think that there's other places that businesses can promote themselves, whereas I've got a directories background, so it's about being able to find the product that you're looking for and making it easy for people to have simple solutions. That makes sense. Making it easier for people is going to encourage people to actually do it. Are you going to have any kind of like ranking or prioritisation, like say that there's three companies that are selling the same kind of product do you go, all right, well, this one has better practices? This will probably not be in stage one of the launch. The idea behind it is that there will be an internal review process. So there'll yeah. be a panel of people that review a product. And when I say review a product, there might be, in your example, if there's three, and I keep saying toothbrushes. <laughs> um, <laughs> But um, if there's three toothbrushes, they can try them all. We can look at the businesses. I'm looking at locally produced. So that's obviously going to be a big calculation. Um, yeah. But it's something that we've started to research. So, again, it will come down to the product. So what is your hope for the future with how we can effectively move society towards making more sustainable choices? Some people are a lot closer to making the right decision. It's probably a business, <laughs> but it sounds a bit condescending and I didn't mean it to come across that way. But I know that we need to transition. I think Australians as a whole are starting to realise that we need to transition. I hope for the sake of our future generations, my kids and their kids, that we do it faster than we have been in the last 10 years. Even the smallest change in behaviour can make a big difference. And I know it needs to be driven by policy and government, but we can all, as individuals, make some impact. So what led your personal journey to coming across that? I have always been a little bit of the earth. I love to garden. I love being outside. I love going to the beach like so many Australians and enjoying wildlife and bird life and all those types of things. There's been a few impacts for me. The bushfires in Victoria, I was stuck in Victoria. That sort of made me wake up a little bit. The bushfires in New South Wales in 2019 and most recently the floods. But on top of that, my COVID hobby... <laughs> <laughs> I decided that I would enrol in university and um, I started studying a sustainable living diploma. It was just I needed, like so many, something to do that didn't mean I had to be out with my friends or yeah. or, or whatever. So that really pushed me along the way and gave me a much deeper understanding of sustainability. A little bit of knowledge for me has been I've gone right into the rabbit hole and I'm sort of a bit obsessed <laughs> not obsessed um but <laughs> interested yeah I mean I think that that curiosity is such a huge part of having that journey and, and it's so interesting one of the subjects I did at uni was the science of climate change and I'm not a scientist don't claim to be still um, <laughs> after doing that class but um it gave me a little bit of knowledge about the scientific importance of climate. What are the most surprising things that you learned along the way when you went down that rabbit hole? I didn't realise how 
I mean, we're talking 2030 and I know it's 2022, but I'd never really thought about, hey, 2030 is only eight years away. That was a big moment for me going, hold on a minute, this is much closer than what we actually think. I remember where I was eight years ago and exactly what I was doing and all those sorts of things. So that reality was not something that I learned at uni, but it was one of those moments in time that made me go, oh, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> let's stop in our tracks and go and just think about this for a moment the bushfires in 2019 I was in northern New South Wales and I got a phone call from a mate saying are you on high alert and I said I didn't think I needed to be and I did we weren't evacuated but that was another moment in time that I thought wow this is on my doorstep and I know so many people that have been affected by the floods in New South Wales Queensland I still have conversations with people about, oh, this isn't going to happen again, as recently as yesterday, in fact. And I am like, are you kidding? We need to wake up to this, that this is going to become more normal. That was a real point in time for a lot of people, especially Lismore in New South Wales, got completely wiped out with the floods and... Yeah, I think that they actually have it happen. It's like, this is the reality. It is scary and in the same breath, devastating. And not necessarily for myself, but just for the people that it affects and it will continue to affect those people. We need to make these changes because it's not just going to be affecting ourselves, but other people. Were there other things that you were surprised to learn? Surprised? Probably not. I mean, I did a subject called Communicating Sustainability. I am a marketer. (laughs) And that whole subject was all about telling stories. I learned a lot about how if you portray a story in a positive light rather than a negative one, then people are more likely to take action. So they can buy into it rather than the doom and gloom that we've gone about with climate change. I found that very interesting that the way that we've been speaking as a society about climate change and, you know, we must do this for the future generations rather than giving it a story of if we do this, it will make our world a lot better. So not necessarily about sustainability itself, more about storytelling. That's an interesting aspect, right, because I think that people resonate emotionally with storytelling a lot better than they do with facts. (laughs) Most definitely. (laughs) I mean, look, I was one of those people, Rebecca, you know, like for years I would be, this is just more doom and gloom about, you know, it's not going to affect me. And it was really a lack of understanding and knowledge about all of those things. But people like Thrive and ourselves need to create a positive story rather than doom and gloom. Like working through hope instead of fear. Absolutely. I love that your work is about empowering people. I know that we don't know each other very well, but that's who I am. Like I've always been that person that people might, you know, how do I do this, Nick? Or how do I do that? And it's always been my passion in life and I found my purpose with sustainability it sort of marries who I am with what I want to do. So would you say that you work more with consumers and that end of things? I will probably work with more of the businesses personally but the website that I build will definitely be consumer driven. There will probably at some stage be a community of people that may want to be involved much like Thrive but it's about giving consumers simple solutions so whether it's choosing a product or like they're renovating or they have to replace their hot water system or whatever the case may be having that information. I suppose that your goal then is to move society by just like making it easier for them. That's my hope. I hope it's that easy. (laughs) When you encounter a dismissive kind of like, I don't want to engage with that, do you have a method to pivot the conversation? There's varying uh, levels of disinterest. Some people are happy to have a conversation around that. I try to understand where they're coming from. It comes from somewhere, whether it's a lack of understanding or your job relies on fossil fuels or it could be anything so it's really trying to understand where they're coming from about where their objection is once you understand where they're coming from it makes it easier to relay that message to them I will never shove anything down anyone's throat if they don't want to listen to me that's perfectly okay yeah yeah you don't want to like you know be going all right listen just you've got to do yeah yeah run for the hills 
I don't want to be that person. I want to lead people in the right direction by example. I'm certainly not perfect, but it's just about making little choices and trying to do the right thing and trying to, like, a lot of this stuff's complicated, you know, like recycling plastic. Yeah, it's it's super hard. (laughs) I hate it. And that doesn't even come into the things that are, you know, not plastic, but they're not cardboard and they're not this. So you're like, I don't know what to do with this. And it's difficult. So I understand that people can't be bothered. They're time poor. They don't want to know. You know, I I get all of that because I feel it sometimes myself. For me now, rather than recycling, I try and buy things that don't produce waste or I use the Australasian recycling labels that is fortunately becoming more prominent to go, okay, well, this is recyclable. So whenever I go to the supermarket, that's how I shop now. I like looking at all the labels. I like looking for things that have already been made from recyclable material because I go, great, yeah. you've already done it so I know that it's recyclable. Exactly. But some people, I mean, look, I'm not one of them, but some people are like, oh, I don't want recyclable. And I, I sort of understand that to a degree. But, you know, as if you buy something that's recyclable, it's a step in the right direction. Definitely, you know, better than not, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I still get caught sometimes. The other day I ducked into the supermarket because I'd run out of something and I wasn't anywhere near where I would normally shop. And I ran in and I grabbed what this one thing that I needed and I got home and I was like, oh. (laughs) Anyway, not perfect, but certainly trying to make a difference. I think that's all you can ask of people. You can't expect people to be perfect there's always so many desires that people have and conflicts that they're dealing with our kids are all grown up so we don't have to shop for them anymore but when you have young kids you need their lunches and their this and their that and let's face it not all of us have time to bake or to make all of these things (laughs) from scratch so it's just about helping them go okay well if I get this instead of this at least there's no waste or there's little waste or it's the, all the waste is recyclable. I suppose like one thing that you're doing as well is you're showing that there's a demand for these sustainable products. There's definitely a demand and I think the more that we request them from our big chains, whether it's supermarkets or other department stores, the more they will be available. I was fortunate enough to spend a couple of years in Western Australia living over there and they were so far ahead of anywhere on the East Coast that I'd been when we went there, and this was a few years ago now, that I was blown away by the products that they had in even the big hardware store. So, yeah, the difference between different states is quite surprising as well. What kind of differences do you see? I don't know now. I was in Western Australia in 2018 and at the time on the East Coast, you couldn't really get biodegradable bags. If you did, you'd have to go to a specialty shop that was all about sustainable living. Yeah. But at the time in Western Australia, you could go into the hardware store and they had all of those sorts of things. I spent hours in there just going, oh, wow, I didn't know. I didn't know this was there. <laughs> It was quite interesting. But, I mean, most of it you do see now. Those are all good changes that we're seeing. And I suppose it also shows the impact that changes from a policy level can propagate down. I think that was definitely led by government over there, which is kind of surprising considering how greatly they rely on mining and if they're at least trying to find a balance. I suppose like even with mining and things like that, I think that there's a misunderstanding of like people think that we only mine coal, for example, Mm. which, you know, is obviously got emissions attached to it. But we also mine a lot of precious metals, lithium, things like that, which, you know, have the batteries for renewable energy and and stuff like that. So, yeah, I read the other day, Rebecca, that, Long story, but I'll give you a quick synopsis. My car was actually in Lismore the day before the floods at a mechanic. He rang us and said, oh, look, do you mind if I keep your car for the weekend? And I was like, yep, no problem. Anyway, Monday the floods came through and it took two weeks for me to learn the fate of my car. I oh, know. <laughs> it survived, but it sent me on this, um, I guess I'm going to have to start shopping for a new car. And I started doing a lot of research into electric vehicles and I was still sort of very interested after I found out that my car had survived. 
But what I did find out was that if I was to just get rid of my car and buy an electric vehicle, that it's actually worse for the earth than keeping my current car because I don't really drive that often. The emissions that it takes to produce the batteries and, and the car itself, it's that you're actually better off at this stage. I'm sure it'll change to yeah. continue just driving the vehicle that you've got now. It's not black or white. It's not you have to buy this product or something like that. If you've already got something at home, buying another one isn't going to be better. <laughs> I was, so I'm going to buy an electric vehicle. I'm going to do this. But yeah, it was something that really surprised me that I'm better off keeping my car for the moment. Producing the new car creates more emissions than what I'm currently creating by yeah. my current vehicle. It's something that I'd really love to see in Australia is a second-hand market for electric vehicles. There's a company, I don't remember their name, so I won't mention it, but there is a company that has started importing vehicles from overseas, electric vehicles, so they are okay. second-hand. They're not Australian second-hand. But still. Yeah, exactly. I guess the problem that we have here is the, the kilometres that you can do on a battery because Australia is such a big country, but it is getting better. I know that they will expand the network of charging stations, so that looks like it's going to improve in the next few years. There's so many opportunities, I think, for going, all right, well, we need that infrastructure. It's certainly a very interesting time. I wish I was, like, 15 years younger and just starting my career <laughs> and had all these, you know, things to choose from. It's a very exciting time, I think, to learn about. I mean, we changed so dramatically when the internet became popular back in the beginning of 2000s, I think was really when it sort of yeah. started. But I think those changes are going to be bigger and brighter. That is a really good point that we have seen these really big, substantial lifestyle and cultural changes so they can happen and I think also in Australia I personally would love to see better rail and things like that please because <laughs> um, I know like in Japan it's like oh yeah you can travel like 400 kilometers in half an hour all across Asia there's amazing networks of of trains and we we're in Beijing years ago now and we caught a train from Beijing down to Shanghai and we actually got there faster on the train than we did if you had a flown. Wow, that's huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and you're like, wow, that's crazy. It's just better. <laughs> I don't know where in Australia you are, but I did hear that the New South Wales government were planning a fast rail from Wollongong up to Newcastle. I think that's been in the plans for like 20 something years. So it's like, hopefully <laughs> that will actually happen. But yeah, the Newcastle to Sydney area has needed that for a while. I grew up in Sydney, so they needed it then. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm sure it hasn't changed. <laughs> I've actually done the commute from Newcastle to Sydney for a while and that was not good. <laughs> I commuted from Sydney to the Central Coast for a period, so I'm hearing you and that's only half the way, so. <laughs> exactly. I mean, even working from home, like COVID obviously had a whole lot of like negative impacts, but we've also seen some positive transitions as well. The ability to work from home obviously takes a lot of vehicles off the road, so it is good for the climate. It depends on your setup at home and how many lights you need to use and all those sorts of things. So it's a lot more complicated than just saying, hey, you're taking a car off the road. But yeah, no, it's certainly an interesting time. We are definitely seeing interesting times and I like to see us be hopeful for the future rather than have that doom and gloom. Definitely. The doom and gloom's not working. We've heard it for how many years now? Let's start to be hopeful and create the change that we want to see and lead by example. Think about the future generations and how it will impact them if we don't make a dramatic change. Yeah, well, having a positive legacy should be something that we all want, right? <laughs> Who wants to be known for doom and gloom? No one. I yeah, exactly. Like, oh, his legacy, he, you know, like, contributed <laughs> to destroying the planet, though. <laughs> well, you know, my mum's generation for a while there, that was the message that they were putting out there, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's our generation's legacy. That's great. No. Yeah, no Thank thanks. <laughs> and let's change that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. I think that's about all we have time for, but... I think we've had a good conversation there. So thank you for joining us. It's really great. Thanks, Rebecca.